everyone. Uh, my name is Archana Rikal. Um, I am the practice lead for the Intelligent Data Division at Synthesis Software Technologies. Um, essentially, my role entails uh, taking a, a completely disparate data set into a production type environment, as well as taking machine learning solutions into a production state. Um, over and above this, essentially, what I do have to do is see where it is fit um, adequately and take a AI solution responsibly into production environment. Um, that's one of the few things that I have to do. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the AWS UG UK Meetup Group for hosting me. Uh, it is an honor to be a part of this webinar. Today, I'd like to talk about machine learning in production using AWS services. So as I mentioned earlier, I am a practice lead in the Intelligent Data Division, but a big component of what I have to do is be the lead machine learning engineer on projects. Uh, what this entails, uh, specifically because our, pro our pro um, company is AWS orientated, is we need to take uh, machine learning solutions or data related solutions into a production environment using AWS services. So we may have a little bit of insight into doing this the right way. Um, so just to start off, uh, I'd like to start off by just giving a brief overview as to what I would be talking about. And then um, basically going around the idea of why this is such a big deal. Why is it so complicated to take, to take a machine learning solution into production over and above our standard um, problems that we have in a, on a daily basis? Um, so one of the objectives that we have is to start off, I'd like to say, what, a, what does it mean to take AI? What does AI mean in practice? Um, there is a lot of buzzwords and a lot of noise around this, uh, this area. So I'd like to maybe give a little bit of insight as to what this actually means in practice and where does the noise stop and the reality begin? Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the, some of the areas that we do need to consider when taking a AI solution or a machine learning solution into a production environment. Um, and what does, what sort of areas does this impact? And then just to, uh, just to solidify a lot of the concepts that I'd, sp I'd, sp I'd be speaking about, just a couple of case studies um, as to how, how, what this means for your business, how this could potentially be used. Um, what are the different sectors that this could impact? And then finally, just a couple of lessons that I've learned on the job. So to start off, um, I'm just gonna give you a very high level view as to what AI is. Uh, don't quote me on this because I don't have a nice enough diagram <laughs> to showcase what AI is. Um, but trust me, there is more than enough resources out there to tell you what AI is. But high level AI is artificial intelligence and it is um, a, a major component out of several different components that include computer vision, machine learning, reinforce, reinforcement learning, predictive analytics. There are several different areas that form part of this. Um, the, the biggest key difference uh, as to uh, the biggest key difference between a standard software engineering project and an AI project is if I could put this simply, um, traditionally we have a bunch of data inputs. We have a system that we build, which would technically be our software engineering. Um, and that system is essentially what uh, dictates the outputs of your data. In the machine learning or in the AI space, it's different. So what we have in this space is we have a bunch of disparate inputs and we have a bunch of outputs that are related to the inputs that we're feeding it with, but we have no idea what sits in the middle. And that's where, where machine learning and AI comes extremely handy because we can't necessarily put, put in any rules in place to say that this input means equals to that output. So we have our machine learning techniques and we have our AI techniques um, that could aid us in figuring out what that middle piece is. Um, the reason why this is such a big big deal is because in this world we have tons of big data coming in we have tons of um, user activities everyone is sitting on a tech device at the moment we have so much information and it's information overload but we're not we don't necessarily use this information and that's where machine learning is key um, and ai is key because now we've gotten to a point where we've captured enough data um, but 
what can we do with that to take it to the next level? And that's where AI is uh, extremely useful. So I give a very high level view uh, as to what AI can potentially be used for. Um, if you have further questions, we can take it at the end, but uh, that's high level what it is. And now just to get into a little bit of detail as to who I am sold into the idea of AI. Um, I kind of know that this is what I need in my business or in my software engineering project now. What should I be concerned about? What should I be looking out for? And um, let's start off with how it can go wrong. How it can go wrong? Several ways it can go wrong. Um, starting off with if you don't have accurate enough data sets, um, starting off with uh, if you don't take it into production the, in the most realistic way, and if you don't take it into production into a responsive manner, then you end up with a mess at the end of the day. And this is no different from a traditional software engineering project where if you don't put the due diligence in place and if you don't put the necessary privacy and the necessary um, operational techniques in place, um, all the hard work that you do could potentially go down the drain. Uh, and it's the same as true for if you don't have enough, uh, enough accurate data sets and don't have enough um, accurate operational on the data, data side of things, it can also go down the drain because um, at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll get into this, but at the end of the day, machine learning and AI is often a small component of the entire system. So if you focus solely on the small component, um, everything else breaks. If everything else breaks, you have no system. And that means that what you were trying to solve for, you just went backwards 10 steps. So that's one of the things you, uh, and I don't even need to mention the lawsuits that could happen around data privacy. Um, I can't, I don't even need to mention, you know, all the predictions that could potentially be wrong and inform people incorrectly as to whether something is uh, profiled correctly or not. A, a key example is, let's say, for example, in the personalization journey, if you don't have accurate enough clustering models that cluster your individuals according to the correct target campaigns, then let's say a, um, a banking client will end up getting a credit client's, uh, credit client's information and, and vice versa. And that may not necessarily be the, the biggest and the worst thing to happen, but there are other cases where you have uh, potentially class, uh, classified or private information that needs to only sit with a specific group of people and that gets leaked into the wrong world. So that's like some of the areas where it could go wrong. Uh, if you go into the computer vision side of things, if you don't accurately classify an image without computer vision techniques, then that could also go wrong. You know, there's, there's so many ways in which it can go wrong. Um, how, how can it potentially be solved for? It's not, it, uh, it might sound silly, but um, how it could potentially be solved for is the same way we, we solve our software engineering problems. Um, same way we've put in our best practices for software engineering, machine learning and AI also has best practices. If these are kept to and if these are constantly monitor, monitored, then we have everything we need to succeed. Um, there is, I mean, once again, I have to put a disclaimer out there. AI is not necessarily a solution and you may find that once you get down into a project that maybe you should pivot. And that's also fine, um, but you need to have the necessary foundation in place in order to figure that out in the long run. Then how can it go right? I think every single piece of device that you have around you, any tech stack you have around you is use, using AI to some extent, from your biometrics device to your facial recognition software to the targeting targeted campaigns that you receive on a daily basis. Um, to your Fitbit, to your Strava, everything is, there is some form of AI in it. There's some form of machine learning. And the benefit is now we're finally getting to a point where we're consuming the data we are producing and we're making it more valuable to people at the end of the day. And that's the, that's the gold in all of this, right? Being able to take big data and make it data-driven decisions and as well as um, using our new techniques that we have in reinforcement learning and in uh, generative algorithms to potentially solve problems that we haven't been able to solve for in the past and really aid human beings to take, take it to the next level. And I have a couple of memes here, but 
I know as, as much of it, this is a joke where you get your, like, for example, with Simpsons, my model was 99% accurate. And then you find this tons of overfitting in the background. Now, what does that mean? It means that the data sets are not adequately monitored or catered for. And the same with the one at the bottom where you have disparate data sorts, you have data sets, you have information, you have knowledge. Eventually all of that, when you put together, you have a conspiracy theory. So it's, it's a joke, but it is, it does happen. It happens a lot more than we'd hope to have, but it happens, right? Uh, and then here's another, another meme, because you can't have a webinar without a meme. And this is something that actually happened uh, where a cat was classified as a dog. Same thing here. Um, this is a classic example of when data sets, if they're not adequately representative of a solution, this is the result. This is the result where you have something completely inaccurate and then you, you have a useless system, right? So it's, it's absolutely crucial to have the know-how to utilize the system and to understand where exactly the downfalls are and how you could potentially solve for it if it does go down. Because we do, we do get a lot, of, a lot of cases where we don't have enough data, we don't know if it's representative enough, but there's techniques we can use. And I will speak to them, um, not in, in a lot of detail because that would require lectures and lectures, but um, essentially there are techniques around it. So it's important to have the right people to guide you in that direction. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna dive a little bit into some of the areas that we need to consider when taking a machine learning model into production. Um, so I did allude to this a bit earlier where I, I mentioned that machine learning and AI is an extremely small component of the entire project. And that's exactly what I'm visualizing here. Um, as you can see, there are several different components we need to cater for before we actually get into machine learning code. Um, so as you can tell, it's literally 10% of the project. So what am I saying here? What I'm trying to say is that when we are doing our machine learning projects, you can't forget your software engineering side of things. You can't forget your cloud engineering. You can't forget your data engineering. All of those are just as important. If anything, machine learning is the final step of software engineering, cloud engineering, and data engineering. Until you have all of that in place, you could have a machine learning uh, algorithm in a in some disparate system, but it's not going to help you in any way. It's not going to be useful enough. Um, so yeah. Uh, in this slide, I'm basically speaking about the different technology stacks. So in here, we don't have. I haven't really mentioned a lot of the AWS uh, tech stacks because um, I just wanted to show you that there is a lot, there is a bunch of open source technology that a lot of us use. But one of the benefits um, is that quite a few of these components you see here have been packaged quite nicely into AWS services. So for example, in the data side of things, you can see we have things like uh, DBC, we have um, Scale, we have Ap Apache Airflow, we have Hadoop, we have uh, the storage the NFSs, the, the, we have the standard, uh, standard storages. Um, all of this is, in, is basically, you could probably say a combination of three or four services that AWS offers. And the benefit of that is that it's, it's, it's already been well packaged and well maintained by AWS in AWS guys. So they, they have more access into maintaining the systems. So yeah, so essentially what I'm showing here is there's different tech, tech stacks that you do need to cater for when you're trying to take a machine learning project into production. Um, then funny enough, you also get the development and the training evaluation step. Now, if you were to look at some of the things here, essentially these are generally custom, generally custom. And uh, if you're in the research space, um, you tend to use a lot of these open source technologies that you see in the development and training evaluation stages. And that's essentially where you sit. Um, one of the downfalls is when you're stuck in this realm of development and training, it becomes very difficult to move it into a deployment stage. So, uh, one of those one of the services that AWS has, and I actually do use it use this quite often, um, along with some of the open source stuff that I use as well, um, is SageMaker. Where SageMaker actually helps you to pull in all these different custom models and um, open source tech stacks into your SageMaker notebook, and then from there you can actually go into a deployment phase. It makes it 
very, very easy to move between the different realms. So yeah, so that's like some of the, the tech stacks that we look at if you're in the research space. Um, but if you're not in the research space, uh, it's, it's also just as relevant um, depending on whether you want open source, if you want to use AWS. Then um, in the deployment sector, and this is where it gets very interesting, right? Because uh, when you move out of the realm of software engineering, you would think that you don't necessarily need your CI CD pipeline. But if anything, there's, it's even more important in the machine learning production world. You need your CI CD as well as your continuous, continuous evaluation. So it's actually even more. Um, and once again, there's a bunch of AWS services that you can use. You can use step functions. You can code deploy this. There's so many. There's a whole plethora of services you can use, but also in the open source world, there's tons of things you can use there as well. Um, but essentially, when you are taking a machine learning, uh, machine learning project or AI project into a production environment, you do need to go through these different sectors. And if, you, if you're missing one of the sectors, then that should be a red flag. Um, okay, so now I'm going to be speaking about a typical machine learning lifecycle. This is a uh, very high level and it's not necessarily going to all the details. You may find sometimes that some of these steps are skipped, but traditionally speaking, when you are taking a machine learning project into a production environment or an AI project for that matter, um, this is typically what it looks like. So to start off with, you would have a business problem. Um, now let's just say for the sake of it, we want to, let's take our personalization example, for example, uh, personalization, um, example. So we have a bunch of data sets. We want to be able to classify them according to different profiles. Um, and then we want to eventually target specific profiles with certain messages based on the activity. So that's the business problem. Now we need to reframe this into a machine learning problem. So what does that mean? We basically high level just say, okay, we need to build a clustering model that takes in all the different data sets and uh, classifies them into 10 different clusters. High level. That's what the that's how you frame it into machine learning problem. Then comes the most interesting part of the journey, which takes majority of the time. I could say probably seventy percent of your time you're spent you spent in this data collection, data cleaning, data visualization process. So in the data collection and integration process, what you would do is you essentially gather all the data, and then you would actually. Um, start looking at different integration points within your infrastructure that you need to pull the data from. So you collect all the data eventually, and then you, once you're satisfied that you've collected enough data, you go into the, into the terrible world of data cleaning and preparation. So I have a lot of PTSD around this because this takes a ton of time, um, especially when you're working with different disparate sources, uh, finding unification across these different data, data sources is, takes forever. It does take a long time, and this is where um, utilizing quite a lot of inbuilt services within AWS has helped speed me up a lot. But over and above AWS, there's also things in the Hadoop environment that has really helped, like using Spark, et cetera. Um, and it really does help speed up the process, but it is still just as tedious when you have to unify a lot of these different data sets. And then um, another challenge that we often come across is the data quality and the consistency that is in these disparate data sets. Um, and there is a lot of techniques we have to push into this into the system to eventually get it into, an, into a relatively clean state. And once we've cleaned it and prepared it into a specific format, the next step is to visualize and analyze. And now in this space, this is essentially when we kind of put together different diagrams and statistical models to figure out what sort of data sets do we have? We start profiling the data, we look at how much of each feature we have. Um, and then once we do start doing that, we start understanding, okay, this is what our data potentially looks like. These are where the strong features are. These are things that could potentially make a difference in this, in this data set. And then we start with feature engineering. So once we go into the feature engineering realm, this is essentially all you're doing here is picking out specific features in your data sets that could make an impact in your final model. So for example, we can say age is a feature. We can say uh, gender is a feature. We can say um, your, your, your device is a feature. So we look at all these different features. We, we both put it all together. We package it into a model eventually. Then we start our training. Um, 
And in this particular stage, once we figure out what features we look at, we basically take our data sets and we divide it into three different sections, one being your validation, your training, and then your final evaluation step. So once you start your model training, you figure out that this model training essentially builds out a model that understands the features you're looking for. It has certain weights that have been associated to each feature. Um, and that helps you to kind of understand where you fit where, what your model is doing, and it actually gives you a model to uh, as a baseline. And then once you have this baseline, you use your your valid. So remember, I mentioned there's these three different data sets. So once you have your validation set, you you basically just check your how well your model is doing to your validation set to see how what your accuracy looks like. If you have an accuracy, and this is depending on the the business problem, obviously, like if you have something that is high risk, you don't want to have an accuracy below um, 98, right? Like when I say high risk, I mean life or death type situation. And if it's something like a like a target mac targeting campaign that isn't really that high risk, then 70, 80, that's still good enough. Um, and that's when you have this, this little step where you check if your business goals have been met. Um, if your business goals haven't been met and you realize that your accuracy isn't as high as you want it to be, then you go, you restart the process. You would have to restart the process and go back into the feature augmentation process. Because if you don't go back and reevaluate the features that you're looking at, um, then it means that you're never going to have a high enough accuracy. So, and this is a, it's a very creative process because you, you may find that things that are obvious to you, like, I mean, you would think that age and gender should make an impact in your model, but if it's not, then you need to get a bit more creative. Maybe you start looking at regions, maybe you start looking at occupation, um, and then you, st you start getting a little bit more creative as to what sort of features you can utilize to get a more accurate prediction. And then you start your, pro your training and evaluation again. And if your business goals have finally been met, you go into model deployment. Now, this model deployment phase is very similar to our CI/CD pipelines that we use within our software engineering side of things. And what you do in this in this phase is literally deploy the model as either as an API or whatever the case may be, um, either API or pickle file or whatever it is that is necessary that you feel is necessary for your model to be deployed into a production environment. And once that has been deployed, you it goes into this prediction service. Um, and this could be an API, a pickle file, whatever the case may be. It's something that you invoke to be able to get predictions from there. And then you have your predictions that is, this is the touch point for your users. Um, a major component of your prediction service is your logging and monitoring. And the reason why this is extremely key is because this logging and monitoring is something that allows you to understand whether your um, model is still relevant. Um, within this, within the, the machine learning engineering space, we get this concept of drift. And if you start figure, finding a drift in your models, then you need to retrain your models because it means that your data sets that you've trained your models on has become, um, has become, uh, it's, it has been, it's not relevant anymore. And then you basically need to retrain everything. And that's the cycle. That's the cycle we follow. So for a lot of these machine, machine learning in particular, AI, it's still a little bit, uh, there are different ways of doing it, but machine learning in specific, this is generally the process we tend to follow. And it is a cyclic process. As you can see, there's tons of errors going backwards and forward, backwards and forward. And that's the reason why when you have a CI CD pipeline, you need to have the continuous evaluation component as well because there is a constant back and forth and you constantly need to reevaluate your model and check if it is actually still relevant. Um, and without having that in place, you don't necessarily have a successful model. Um, the model is genuinely, the model is only as good as the data sets you feed it with. And if, you feed it, if your data sets become irrelevant into your problem, then you need to retrain. And then only will you get the, the true benefits of your model in production. Um, this is just another view as to how you can actually go about representing the machine learning life cycle, but it's essentially the same thing. But, and what I think is key here is the data component, uh, which is all of this yellow. And the reason why I'm putting a lot of focus and effort into data in specific, because in the machine learning space, data is absolutely essential to building out a model and not just any data, because I've actually been asked the question quite a few times, like, 
Um, does it mean just because you have a lot of data doesn't mean that you have a good enough model? No, uh, a lot of good data, a lot of clean data and a lot of high quality data. That's essentially what you need. So if you don't have these um, good high quality data sets, you have a very bad machine learning model in production. So a lot of emphasis should be put on your data um, infrastructure, your data capturing process, as well as your um, EDA or exploratory data analysis, because that's essentially the point of intersection between success and failure. Um, if that part doesn't happen well enough, the rest of it is basically null and void. Um, I'm gonna dive a little bit into some of the case studies and just to give you a sense of what sort of, what sort of um, problems machine learning could solve for. So I have worked in the financial sector, the mining sector and the healthcare sector. Um, my two main sectors that I've worked in is the financial and the mining sector. The healthcare sector, because of all the compliance and the privacy, privacy constraints that we have, uh, I unfortunately haven't been able to take anything into a production setting per se. Um, so uh, most of my, my learnings is from the financial and the mining sector. I have done quite a little, lot of research in the healthcare sector and I'm hoping to really get into that, that um, sector soon. <laughs> okay, so in the financial sector, the case study that I'm gonna be walking, th walking you through is particular to fraud detection. So you may or may not have heard about this concept of fraud detection and how machine learning can solve for it. So just to give you a high level view, the problem that we needed to solve for was um, high volumes of, I think it was close to terabytes worth of um, streaming data that contained transactional elements. Transactional like POS devices, uh, credit cards. There's so many different transactions that we were collecting from this financial um, bank. And what we needed to do was there was certain it wasn't apparent, but they could sense that there were certain fraud cases that were being uh, picked up. And often it was a lot a case of intuition. So you had people on the ground, SMEs in the space that actually had lots of intuition as to understanding whether something is fraudulent or not. So what we wanted to do was take that intuition and put it into a model so we can make this more scalable across the bank. Because what we found is that a lot of the people who had these um, sub subject matter experts and who could easily find these fraudulent, uh, fraudulent transactions were significantly well off than the other sectors, which is unfair. You do want to have that uh, knowledge transferred across different, different sectors within the industry. And you want everyone to benefit at the end of the day because fraud is, is a problem that everyone has. So essentially what uh, we built, what we built out was a standard process. So traditionally when we start off a machine learning project, we start off very small, start off very small, build something in a small little sandbox environment, see if it actually is worthwhile. Because often you find, and as you saw from the machine learning life cycle, often you find that um, it's not worth it or you don't have data sets that really support the solution and you have to constantly keep being creative about finding different uh, data sets. So you start off very small, you start off in very small timelines um, and you try and deliver value as soon as possible because you we go with the fail fast approach. So we started off with saying, okay, let's look at some transactional information and let's see if we can find fraud. So we were very naive initially and we took a uh, very basic, uh, basic approach. Um, as you may identify some of the services on the on the screen, we have the API gateway, we have, we have Lambda, we have our Kinesis data firehose, we have our SD bucket, we have our QuickSight, then we have our SageMaker anomaly detection for the anomaly detection, SageMaker for our fraud detection, and finally we have our SD buckets. So just to walk you through what all of this means, um, we have our S3 bucket, which is which contains our model and the data that we would be training our um, fraud detection and anomaly detection models on. So this is just a bunch of transactional information. So obviously all of this was prepared, cleaned. Um, it had it was in the correct format, and then we were able to identify features. And then in using SageMaker, we pulled in the it was uh, random forest and XGBoost into the SageMaker notebook, and then from there we were able to to create an anomaly detection model and a fraud detection model. 
So like I mentioned, we were naive in the beginning and the features that we picked out were very, very, um, they didn't really have as great results as we hoped it would. Then eventually we got to the point where we figured that this wasn't accurate enough and we went to the subject matter experts and we asked them like, when you are building, when you intuitively figure out that there is a fraudster, what do you look at? And then they told us specific features that they look at is the point of origin, the amount of a transaction, as well as the frequency of the transaction. And that was when it was a game changer for us because now, because we have some something that the subject matter experts don't have, which is the computational capability and as well as the large amounts of data sets that we can easily sift through. So once we were able to figure out that those are the specific features that we need to look at, we obviously added a bit more extra to that. But once we figured out those are the specific features that we need to look out for, it really changed the accuracy. So the accuracy was sitting at 67%, which is terrible. And it jumped to 92%, which is a massive growth since we chose the right features. And once we chose the right features, we, we deployed the model um, and using Lambda service and API Gateway, we made that available for prediction, predictions. And every time that was invoked, every time the feature, I mean, every time the model was invoked, um, it was pushed through the Kinesis data fire hose, captured into an S3 bucket, and all the results were then um, further further uh, further processed and stored into Amazon QuickSight. So we had a quick and easy visual to see how well the results are doing and we have a logging and monitoring in place. And that's how we were able to manage to solve, there was quite a huge cartel around um, debit orders. And we were able to figure out that as a result of that, we could, we understood that these specific cartels that were, um, they were putting debit orders below, so, South Africa. So they were putting debit orders below 200 grand, which doesn't require a approval process. So which means that there was random accounts everywhere that had these debit orders below 200 grand and uh, they were coming from specific origins that would constantly change. But they were, there was a pattern that we were able to identify and we, were, we managed to, to avoid a lawsuit essentially. But so that is the power. That is the power of having the computation and the data available to you. And the fact that everything is so streamlined and interconnected so nicely with these services, we were able to build this out. This, I think this literally took us three weeks. This took us three weeks for the entire um, back and forth process and everything. And we managed to solve this. Obviously, a lot of it, um, a lot of the time was spent in gathering data. So I'm not including that in the three process, but this is essentially what it came down to. Um, so yeah, that is that is one of the really cool fraud detection cases that we we're able to solve for. So once we were able to solve the initial value proposition and we were able to really understand that the specific features that we we're looking for, we had to take it one step further. And funny enough, at that point, um, AWS because they're so great, great with the ML services, they they were able to um, take. I think with their with the researchers that they have and with the with all the knowledge base that they have actually collected over time, they were able to take the machine learning models that their researchers had built and put it and package it into a nice little solution called Amazon Forecast, which helps you to kind of pick up these fraud detection and um, anomalies in your data sets uh, quite easily. So that made it quite easy for us because then from a three week period, we could easily chop it down to a matter of days. So eventually we were able to string along, string out, string along all these different data sets. Uh, we were able to put in a nice little process and hence the step functions that you see there in the middle. Um, and that was able to facilitate the entire machine learning life cycle at, at the second phase of production. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through what the CI, CD and um, CE process looked for a machine learning project. Uh, you will probably find that this is very, very similar to the, um, it's extremely similar to the software engineering process. But so typically what you would have is you have all your different disparate data sources. That's your JSON, your RDS, your Dynamo, your Oracle, whatever data sources that you, that you want. And then you need to clean and pro prepare the data sets use, and we use Glue um, to kind of consolidate everything into one diff one area and push, push it out in uh, push it out into a unified uh, format 
uh, we've referred to them as assets or data sets, whatever the case may be, whatever you call them, and we drop this into an S3 bucket. From here, we actually get them, the ML developer, ML engineer, whoever it is, there's different names for these these days, but essentially you would get them to um, start off the pipeline with, uh, co with training, deploying, testing, and integrating. Once the model has been evaluated, I mean, once the model has been uh, tested and we are happy with the final um, accuracy, what we then do is we go into a validation and a request procedure, which is essentially getting, it's similar to, you know, how uh, a, once you do a Git pull or, or get, uh, you get a Git pre peer review, similar process, we get someone else to approve your request and then it gets pushed into the next level. Uh, once you, once it's pushed into the next level, you need to then launch your training job from scratch. So once you launch your training job, this is the process where you, uh, I did mention it earlier, but this is the process where you need to take your, your first phase of your data set and you train your model on that um, disparate data set. And once you've done that, you would deploy that to dev um, and you would deploy that into, um, deploy that into a, a final, like an API of, or deployment prediction service. And then from there, you would get an approver to either approve the deploy, deployment or not. The key here is once you get the approver to, do, uh, to approve this deployment, this becomes publicly available. When I say publicly available, available within your infrastructure, but um, it's a, a accessible to further testing and further evaluation. And once that has been completed, you then would deploy to prod, um, and then you would go into the next step of your model deployment, which would then further take that one, one isolated the prediction service and then scale it across different containers. And that is basically very similar to the software engineering process. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, as much as you have your machine learning engineering, um, it's just the same as software engineering, just with some extra machine learning algorithm in the middle that you have to cater for as well. Um, something that I haven't really shown here is the second phase of this is the logging and monitoring. Um, and in the logging and monitoring phase, essentially what happens is you have all of this happening all the time and you have all these prediction services constantly being hit. You have all these results coming in at all, at all times and you need a way to see whether this is uh, accurate enough or not. You need to see if this is actually still relevant. If you find, and there is often a graph that you would you would draw um, on your, so with SageMaker now they've released the, the new version and there's actually capability to actually see how well your model is doing in production. So, that that that's the case now. And when we when we were still busy deploying this, we had to kind of figure this out ourselves and build our build our uh, evaluation metrics on QuickSight um, and CloudWatch to actually see how well our models are doing, um, or do it locally. So it was that those are the options we had. But luckily, the services have really adapted over time, and it's which is great for us because now we don't have to go anywhere else to go do all these things. We can actually just do it in one little notebook now. Um, so yes, so that's essentially what I wanted to speak about in, in this section around the fraud detection use case. Um, I will have time for questions at the end of the webinar um, and we can, we can get into as much detail as you'd like. Um, another, another sector that has been, that I've, I've had the privilege of working in is the mining sector. And this, this looks like a very, <laughs> it looks like a very complicated diagram. But um, I can't, unfortunately, I can't really show the, I can't show the, the architecture behind this in full detail because it is, um, the, pen, the patent is pending, so I can't really disclose that just, just yet. But I can speak to the problem domain and how we went about solving it, um, what are certain characteristics that we have to look out for. So when, when, uh, when, we, st when we initially started off with this project, I was, I was still in university at that point, and um, as a student, I was still uh, I was given this problem where in the mining sector um, we had quite a significant injury rate in one of the particular one of the mines, and what we needed to do was create a solution that could potentially assist 
human beings that would have to go 300 feet on the ground and drive these vehicles manually. So the process that we followed is naively enough, we, we were like, okay, why don't we just do a self-driving vehicle, uh, remove the human being out of the equation? Naively, we said this. But essentially what happened over time is we realized, obviously, there are a lot of factors that we need to take into consideration. Um, there are very, very specific problems that we need to account for when, when building out the solution. And that's essentially where we had to utilize AWS services. We had to utilize the concept of streaming. We had to use to utilize generative algorithms. There's quite a lot of things that a lot of different tech stacks um, that we had to utilize in order to actually build the entire end-to-end -end solution. Um, and there's a, there were a bunch of sensors. There were different, yeah, like I mentioned, there was there's quite a few different areas that we need to cater, needed to cater for. So the problem domain was we had this vehicle that needed to firstly needed to drive drive well underground and underground is very very um it's extremely dark there is no visibility there is it's very um it's very very difficult terrains that that the vehicle would need to drive drive as well as unexpected conditions there were quite a few difficulties we had because there was also a connectivity issue that we needed to solve for as well so how we went about solving this initially was we started off with, we knew that we needed to build, we needed sensors to actually take in all this information. Um, and what was very, very useful in this particular instance was um, we utilized AWS's vent bridge. And what helped us here is we knew that the connectivity was really bad. <laughs> underground, but luckily one of the things we did have was LiDAR and we had a very good VPN tunnel connection into the cloud infrastructure uh, that was sitting literally maybe 10 feet away. So that was very, very useful for us. And um, because we had that capability, we were able to plug into EventsBridge and monitor the sensors quite effectively. Um, but that was not the end to our our success story. <laughs> there was still several different problems we needed to cater for, and so as much as we we so we had a humidity sensor, we had a vibration sensor, and we had a um, we had a light sensor as well in the sensor sensor row. And eventually, what we figured is that it wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient to be able to produce inputs from these sensors to control the vehicle. And um, we then realized that we need to actually get into the world of machine learning. We needed to be able to understand what the terrain looked like beforehand, train the model to, to uh, train the model to kind of expect or at least have a set of rules that was built into specific conditions and we needed to add an extra input input uh, values input streams into this uh, data into this uh, sensor sensor stream so uh, over and above those three sensors we need to bring in lidar we needed to bring in camera and you may ask how did camera really work so i'll i'll get to that but essentially and there was three or four other different um sensors we needed to bring in. Eventually we got into a concept of rotational sensor devices. And um, we, so what we, what we did was we coupled all of these rotational sensor devices into EventsBridge. Um, what EventsBridge had was very, very cool because we needed to constantly monitor schemas and we needed to rotate these schemas as and when an input comes in. So because in EventsBridge, there is a concept of schema registries and there is a concept of um, understanding what input sources have come through, we were able to couple that up with our service serverless architecture um, using our lambdas to understand what input is being read and what that means. Um, so that was that was very useful for the real time context of things. Um, but we still had a challenge because we didn't necessarily know how exactly we would need to inter uh, how exactly we would need to react to specific condition conditions underground. So. There were, then came the concept where we needed to have a little mini little robot. It was actually a cute little robot device that we had to run around the entire mine a couple of times to scan the area. Um, and when scanning the area, we were able to generate an algorithm that could react to specific conditions with the sensor inputs. 
Um, and this is when we use the concept of reinforcement learning because we needed to basically have a reward, um, a reward mechanism and a failure mechanism every time that something wrong happened. So essentially this little bot device would run around the entire underground, underground tunnel. And every time it would knock into a rock, it would get a negative reward. And eventually over time, after a couple of so a uh, couple of interactions around the around the tunnel, we were able to build a good enough model that understands what needs to happen at different um, intersection points in the in the tunnel. So once we were able to get this reinforcement model into a production environment, and we use statement for this as well, we were able to then package this into into a prediction service and. Every time an events bridge sent through input stream information, um, we were able to then actually get a prediction out of it to see to understand what needs to happen with the vehicle itself. But it didn't end there. We needed to take it one step further, and we needed we needed extra um, we needed extra uh, insight into the data into the actual input stream as well because we needed to now take all that information and we needed to translate that into actual actionable points um, and one of the one of the uh, points that we need I'd need to raise is when we're t when we're taking an artificial intelligence system into production we can't necessarily remove the human element out of this artificial intelligence is there to actually assist assist human beings with a, a task. It's not there to replace a human being. So as much as we had now, we had these input streams, we had this um, scanned environment and we had specific reaction techniques, we needed to take it one step further and have a human being also be able to intervene when it was necessary. And um, with the problem now, it, it comes back to the, the visual element where we had the problem of being able to take a visual, we couldn't necessarily get a good enough visual technique to, or we, we didn't have a good enough qu camera quality underground. And over and above that, the connectivity wasn't the best either when with transferring large packets of data. So essentially what we needed to do was actually take the, um, take the visual coming from the camera and then we needed to apply a generative algorithm on top of that visual. Um, at the control center so that we can actually mimic or kind of figure out what the next, what the visual is supposed to look like. Um, this is very similar to the technique that you would find with deep fakes, um, where you would have sort of looking face and you would kind of uh, morph the rest of the face into what needs to happen. And it's a similar technique we use with these, with these visuals coming into the control center as well. And um, one of the key components here is that it wasn't just one one uh, input stream that we needed to consider for this for the system. We needed to take into account the input input array, which contained all these different sensors. We need to take the lidar into account just to see if there's any kind of um, inter intrusions that we needed to cater for. We needed to take in the camera inputs that were coming in as well, just to see if there is any visual visual things that could assist us. And once we've combined all these different input input sources together, we needed to couple that with the reinforce reinforcement learning um, model that we had to actually build out as a result of the early pre work with the little bot running around the tunnel as well. So, taking all these different services into account, we managed to build a good enough system that was able to um, constantly be monitored by a human at the other at the end of the day and um, in the control center. The human being was removed from the from the very bad environment that was causing all the the health issues, and was taken into a control center environment. And now they have all the necessary inputs and all the necessary information that they need to make a, uh, a well thought out decision as to how the vehicle should be driving. Uh, for most parts of it, they were it was self-driving to a great extent. However, there were certain instances where human beings did need to intervene. Um, and because the connectivity was relatively strong, um, it was able to actually make a ping and, and either switch off the device or prevent it from making a turn. So this was very high level how we were able to um, actually take our 
we thought it would be very simple to build this out. And we were a, then we realized that it wasn't so simple. But taking all these different disparate input sources, most of it which were real time, um, building it out into a model that was able to perform um, inferences on the fly, and as well as being able to take a visual element and reconstructing the visual element to make more sense so that at the end of the day, the human being is well supported to make a, a well-informed decision in the event that the vehicle needs to be uh, taken over and driven um, from the control center. And that's the high level, the, the product that we had to build out at the mining sector. Um, this did start off as uh, my research project eventually translated into my master's project. And uh, finally, three years later, we were able to get this uh, this, uh, this entire solution into a production state, and it is currently running um, at the mines. So crossing fingers, hopefully nothing breaks. And then finally, uh, just as a final case study that I'd like to um, speak to is the in the health sector. So like I've mentioned before, the health sector is unfortunately very, very um, closed off when it comes to utilizing new systems and utilizing new tech, um, and rightfully so, right? Because they are working with very, very sensitive information and they're working with um, with uh, privacy of a different level, right? Um, we're working with healthcare information and we don't necessarily want healthcare information out in the public. So one of the products projects that I, ha I had the opportunity of working on within my research space was being able to make malaria predictions from metabolic rates. So um, when we started off, it was a collaboration with the bioinformatics team at Stellenbosch and essentially what Stellenbosch a University in, in South Africa. And essentially what we had was we actually were able to collect uh, a bunch of different data, dis da different disparate data sets um, from various institutes. Uh, along with along with weather information, along with um, uh, disease occurrence, as well as the metab metabolic rates, uh, we were able to collect all that information initially. And what we started off was was at finding specific features. And obviously, I wasn't able to speak to the features. This is specifically for an SME to tell me what what features are necessary, what is not necessary. Um, it's a completely different domain. Um, eventually, we, I mean, I did learn a lot about metabolic rates as a result of it, but uh, eventually we, we tried to figure out what sort of features would be necessary to actually build out, um, to actually build out the final prediction model to kind of infer whether someone has malaria or not. Uh, when we built this out, we didn't use any AWS services. This was purely done in local machines. This was in Jupyter Notebooks that we just We'll flesh this out. So it was all done locally. There was no other computation, compute, computing we we actually had access to. We weren't allowed to um, at that stage. This was a couple of years ago. And once we were fine, what we what we were able to do though is we we didn't understand or really know which sort of models would actually give us a accurate enough prediction. So we built out four different models. That's the OLS, the RIMA, DNN, and LSTM. Uh, we built out all these four models into the to the production environment, and then we started check, te testing the RM RMSC, which is essentially the performance and the accuracy as to understanding whether this is accurate enough model or not. Um, unfortunately, we weren't very successful in these initial in the initial uh, data sets. So we thought about it and we we tried to figure out if there's an, any other kind of a feature that we could potentially include into this um, into the stream to actually assist further, and that's when we had the idea of bringing in social media information, and we brought in Twitter data sets. So what was key here was, along with um, weather information, uh, what Twitter was able to give us was an understanding as to population dynamics and understanding how populations were moving across across the country, uh, which would further inform. Um, specifics around whether someone is more highly likely to have malaria or not, um, as well as the specific uh, news news that was reported and uh, where people are interacting mostly. That was 
that was extremely valuable when bringing in social media information. So eventually when we found, when we found that the Twitter information was actually assisting us and it significantly improved our RMSE, um, we, we ran it through all our prediction models and eventually the winner out of all three, all four of them was the DNN and that performed the, the highest um, in terms of understanding whether malaria, whether someone has malaria or not from the metabolic rates. So like I mentioned, this was all done in a, um, this is all done in a local Jupyter notebook and it was all done uh, very manually. If something like this were to be taken into a production environment and um, actually be ta being taken to the next level, um, luckily with all the different uh, features that AWS has recently released, um, specifically around HIPAA compliant data lakes um, and Comprehend, we would actually be able to take this into production relatively quickly now because all the data sets would be anonymized and all the private information would also be removed from this from this um, infrastructure. And um, as well as the one key, com one, something that we really struggled with was since we were doing everything manually, we had to build our streaming environment on our, on our local machines, which was very difficult. So we really missed the cloud environment when doing everything locally because it was, it was so slow. Everything was taking forever. We didn't have the, uh, the capability to do it for auto scaling. So if we were to take this into production environment, another key, key factor would be taking into cloud using the streaming environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be Kinesis. We could even get into the world of Kafka um, to actually pull in all that information and further process it in there. Um, the point is that we have finally gotten to a, a point in time with AWS as well as the other services um, within, within um, all the tech stack we have available to actually cater for healthcare um, and actually take uh, and as well as use AI to assist the healthcare industry. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, considering the times we're in right now, considering everything that has happened, um, we find, when I say we, I mean me and a bunch of my research group, find that AI could really assist the healthcare industry, um, not just from a um, diagnosis perspective, but also from a predictive perspective. Um, we really think that AI could assist our frontline workers um, to a great degree. We don't, and the, the idea is that AI is there to assist human beings. It's there to assist human beings and allow for human beings to actually um, take things one step, uh, one step further and get machines to do the grunt work for them and get people uh, so if we're talking specifically to healthcare sector, get, get people to firstly be protected and secondly, be able to focus on patient care. And we really feel that if we can build AI in the sector, we could really assist quite a bit. So uh, the last thing I'd like to speak about is the lessons that I've learned from the different sectors. Um, these are just a few of the projects that I've worked on. There have been several and not all of them have been successful. I've had quite a few failures as well, but um, just learning, but it has been quite a good learning experience for me. And just to, to iterate some of the lessons that I've learned, um, one thing I've realized is firstly, AI is a buzzword. It does cause a lot of excitement, but as a result of that, it also causes a lot of misinformation. And um, uh, so one of the key components is to be extremely careful about how it's presented and to utilize AI when necessary. When it's not necessary, don't use AI. Um, when it's not necessary, use something that is simpler. Um, use something that you can actually have more control over if, if you feel that your domain is not ready for it. It is important to be ready for AI. It is important to have that data-driven uh, data -driven mindset. If, if all of that is not catered for, then it might be worthwhile to first understand what it would take to get for you to get to that stage first before you actually even consider um, an AI project. So um, to start off, I'd like to say that, you know, as much as, and I did refer to this in the mining project in specific, um, AI is used to augment employees' work. It's not, it's not used to replace them. It can't, it can't replace them. Um, we are 
we're fast growing into 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 a field where um, human beings think that uh, just by removing all the grunt work, they are now redundant. But that's not the case. Human beings have the ability to create AI, so they also have the ability to to exceed expectations around what they can, what they are capable of. Um, and this is from an ethics point of view, because this is a huge for anyone in the space. Um, ethics is a huge con concern um, because there is a lot of detrimental effects if it isn't it isn't complied with. So, uh, from an ethics point of view, it is always important to augment an employee rather than replace them. Um, and so that's that's something that is worthwhile considering uh, when taking an AI project into production. Um, and this is the next point that is there that's saying that no, that early AI projects often fail. I am testament to this. I have had several failures in these AI projects um, for many reasons, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one of them being the, the environment and the infrastructure not being ready to handle an AI project. Um, another one being people not being ready to take, take the understanding of what AI is and what it can actually do for them. Uh, the misinformation around AI, so as well as the, the technology readiness. Um, there is a few components that you need to have ready. You need to have your data ready. You need to have your data in a specific format. Um, you need to have the subject matter experts in the room. Um, and without having those learnings and having those failures, I wouldn't have known this. And that's why I know that early AI projects often do fail. But if you have these AI projects with the right with the right people to, to consult with or the right people to actually give you guidance around this, um, take it, <laughs> take that opportunity because there's a lot of learnings you get from failures as well. Um, and then another very important component and just to speak to what, what my background is, I started off as a software engineer. Um, that is my background and that's uh, my foundation. Um, and for me personally, I feel that if I didn't have that software engineering background, I would not have been able to, to, to have even a few successful projects. Um, and because of having that software engineering mindset and a passion in the AI space, um, I was able to include AI into my software research as well. And um, as a result of that, you, you find that there is actually a combination, it's a comb combined effort. And if you have this combined effort, you can actually take something that may seem like an imagination into a reality, into a realistic project. So um, AI on its own means nothing until you have the software um, element to complement it as well. Um, the next point is focusing on the data engineering component. And I can't stress this enough. Um, you do need to have a solid data engineering component. You need to have a solid team. You need to have a solid infrastructure um, and not just for being able to manipulate your data and um, clean out your data, but to also have a good support structure to understanding whether you have good data, um, data quality, data cleanliness, cleanliness, consistency, all of that needs to be constantly monitored. So it's not just about um, Python using Python and having a bunch of Panda frameworks to manipulate your data sets. It's also about understanding the data that is being collected, how good it is, understanding the metrics behind it. Um, and then from an ethics point of view, also being able to translate and see what the lineage of your data is and understanding the metadata behind the data. So that in the event that um, your data doesn't starts giving you funny values in your model, you have a, a log to trace back and see where it starts. Um, it, it happens a lot more than you think it does happen where you need to go back and check your old versions of your data to see where things did go funky along the way. So that, that data engineering component is extremely important as well. Then the next one, it sounds, it sounds crazy, but um, it is important to adjust your definition of an AI project. It's not as uh, hunky-dory as um, you may see on the on on YouTube videos or wherever you find these crazy videos uh, and uh, articles, an AI project isn't the bullet solution to everything. Um, you do find that there is a lot of fundamentals and foundations that need to be built out quite nicely 
Um, luckily, well, because I'm from, I've, I've worked predominantly in the AWS space. Luckily, there there is a lot of uh, it does. AWS services do make it quite easy for you to build out that foundation. But you need to have the know how. You need to have the know how to utilize those services in a in a well managed way, so that when you are when you are trying to uh, build your AI project, you have that foundation in place. And then eventually you may even get to a point where you think that your AI project isn't necessarily an AI project because just by by solving that foundational element, maybe that's all you needed. Maybe that's what you needed to sort out. And now you've got enough of a value-driven business um, and you don't necessarily need AI. That that does happen. That often happens quite often. So as much as you think that just by dropping AI into the solution, it fixes everything and you have tons of case studies stating that it has actually fixed the problem. It may be as simple as just by f- fixing your foundational things that are necessary for your AI project, you solved your problem along the way. So yes, it is It is important to understand and readjust the definition of your AI project along the process. Um, then another very, very important lesson that I've learned is focusing on soft outcomes. So in the past, I was very uh, focused around the hard outcomes, understanding the accuracy of your solution and understanding um, how well your feature sets are doing and looking at what the predictions are giving. And what I realized is that specifically in the machine learning and the AI space, it doesn't necessarily make sense to focus on those hard outcomes because the data is dynamic. The data is forever changing. And with having these forever changing data sets, you can't necessarily build towards a hard outcome. You have to rather focus on the infrastructure, rather focus on the machine learning engineering side of things to ensure that it caters for these new sort of um, new anomalies and new data sets that come into the pipeline and it can be agile enough to cater for these new things coming into the pipeline rather than building it to a specific spec. Um, and I have, I mean, after I changed that that mindset in my head, uh, things have definitely been a lot easier for me because now it's more around, I know that I can build a machine and engineering platform that can satisfy the outcomes but I'm also aware that if I don't build this foundation and this infrastructure solidly enough, um, it will not it will not hold for a long uh, for a longer period of time. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the it's a machine learning model is very dependent on data sets, and it's it's only as flexible as the data you have. So if you if you build towards a very hard, robust data set that you think won't change it's best to get out of that mindset as soon as possible. Then the final thing that I'd like to leave everyone with is um, AI ethics. And I didn't mention this in the beginning, but um, AI ethics could mean different things to different people. But um, one word of advice is when you are building an AI project, uh, make sure you have have done your due diligence about understanding what sort of ethical implications you have. Um, look at the human component, look at the data component, look at all these different um, different catalogs that you can find around AI ethics and make sure you incorporate them into your project from day one. Um, rather start, start early than late uh, because those AI ethics could really determine um, the way forward in your project in the long run. So that is everything I have around um, what machine learning means in production. I'm happy to ask questions. If we have time, I could show you a very short demo as well. I'll leave this up to the organizers as well. Uh, but thank you for listening to me. I hope that, firstly, um, I really hope that I was able to get through to all of you and, and give you a little bit more of an understanding as to what it really takes to take a machine learning project into production. Um, I'm keen to see what sort of questions you all have for me. Thank you. And uh, indeed, we are keen to hear your questions. In fact, there's been a lot of great discussion in the uh, in the Twitch stream this evening. Obviously, lots of people with uh, some level of experience in the AI and ML space. Um, I've definitely learned some things this evening. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm I'm not really an ML expert. Uh, AI isn't really my area. Um, but that's why we have Archie joining us all the way from um, Johannesburg, I believe. Um, which I think is that the same time zone as we're in in London, or are you an hour different? 
No, I'm be, I'm in front of you guys. Right. So it's a, it's a <laughs> it's bit later for you. Nine thirty six. Gotcha. Um, cool. So um, I'm going to. I know you've answered some of these questions actually in the chat already. I'm going to uh, ask some of them for the benefit of, of people who are going to be watching this on the on the video stream later. I should also say to, to those of you watching, um, because of a bit of a miscommunication, Archie's original video was actually uh, longer than this and has a couple of other case studies. Um, and uh, I sort of took the took the editor's knife to that to to fit in time this evening. Um, but we will be putting the full version of Archie's talk with the additional uh, case studies, uh, one of which is on mining and the other uh, is in, in the healthcare uh, sector. If you're interested in, in seeing a bit more, the uh, the financial services one was a bit more AWS specific and you had sort of AWS diagrams the other two were a bit less so. So um, if you do want to do want to uh, watch the whole thing, we'll be posting that on our, um, on our YouTube channel um, and uh, we will link to that from uh, the social medias and so forth. Um, so going back to uh, you, Archie, um, early question was sort of, um, you know, how can you tell whether a, a problem is a good fit for ML or not? What what, what are the ways in which you can look at that and uh, and figure out whether that's the right uh, the right hammer for that particular nail? And and I I think that was a brilliant question, honestly speaking, because often you get a get to a point where you're not really sure whether someone is throwing AI into the solution for the sake of it or if it really is needed. So um, traditionally speaking, how we go about uh, go about solving that particular problem is we have to follow to understand what the domains of your problem is. Um, if it is something that fits into the realm of NLP or computer vision or even RPA, then we do take it in as a um, AI, AI problem. But over and above that, something that's even more important is understanding whether your system or your environment is ready for AI and data-driven decisions. Um, so first, we start off by seeing whether your use case is an AI solution, and then we look at the readiness. And if the readiness is not there, then we actually don't take that on as an AI project at all. So the readiness is more important than actually understanding whether the business case is AI-driven or not. Gotcha. Um, one of the things I really liked about uh, about the way you talk about this problem is, is of... Uh, AI and ML as being sort of um, you know also dependent on software engineering methodologies, right? This isn't this isn't new and unique in uh, in how we should be thinking about running it, monitoring it, sort of putting it through our CI/CD pipeline. That's really uh, really good to, to see. Um, I guess my, I'm not a hundred percent clear. I guess um, on how much of this you would consider production environment and how much of it is sort of something off to the side that's churning through data. You maybe talk a little bit about sort of, I guess, the life cycle of, um, you know, are you, are you building what is essentially a production model building environment that is spitting out artifacts for your production thing that's using the model uh, to use? Um, do you have staging environments for those things? How do developers work on it? Those sorts of considerations would be interesting to get into. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a very, very interesting question, that one, because so unlike a traditional software engineering project, those software engineering projects do have this as well, where you have an initial POC and then you would move it up into a production type uh, setting. So um, AI projects are very similar in that regard, but the only difference is that we have several small iterations we have to go through to deliver business value. So you try and tackle a very small use case and try and deliver a specific um, problem. And if it is if it is successful, then we would roll it up to the next phase. If not, then we have to reiterate and go back and figure out what the features are and re redo that entire process until we get to a point where we think that a model is actually ready for a production type environment. So when you're in that initial sandbox phase, you don't necessarily need a staging environment, a production environment, or the traditional um, CICE pipeline that you would have. Um, it's more about just quickly fail fast, see if in forward. And only once you go through that very rigorous uh, phase of understanding your true business value around your model, do you actually take it into a production environment. And when you take it into a production environment, it's actually very, very similar to a software engineering uh, project. You would have your typical CI CD pipeline, you would have your you would have one extra step, which is continuous evaluation as well, which is constantly monitoring to see if your uh, model is still uh, still relevant to your solution. Um, but like I mentioned in my talk, a uh, machine learning model is a small little component of an entire system. And that's why as much as we say that uh, machine learning is a whole different world, it's actually more of a single world rather than a machine learning world. So all those concepts that we traditionally use in the software engineering project is still relevant when you take it into a production environment. Gotcha. 
Yeah, I think um, I run a consultancy, and I think it, when we sort of go into organisations that have um, things that sit on the outside of their application, right? The the, the other things, the, the the data warehouses and the yes, machine learning and all, all those kind of bits yeah. and pieces, they tend to be a little bit of a wild west by comparison. The uh, the sort of the, the work that's mm-hmm. going on in the in the application domain is is a bit more regimented than the uh, than the work that's going on elsewhere. Is that a reflection of the um, possibly the, the youth, uh, you know, the early the early stage of, of of that technology is that something that you would see improving over time as you know for example amazon release big lumps of thing that solve problems that you had to wire together yourself two years ago definitely definitely i have to i have to agree with agree with that a hundred times because so like if i'm to look at the aws services two years ago and the the production loads that i had to take into production um they i had to through hoops um to get it into the that stage but now um, over time I think AWS in specific like I mean reInvent really excite, excited me because a lot of the problems that I had before and I had to jump through several hoops to get through is literally an API call away now so things have definitely changed and have definitely improved over time to facilitate for more machine learning and more AI type solutions which is super exciting for people like us because we don't have to go around in circles to get something done anymore so yeah I'm, I'm actually super excited about a lot of the reinvent solutions because they have catered for the problems we were traditionally having as a machine learning engineer yeah yeah it's a, it's a bit of a mixed uh, uh, mixed bag as a consultancy i guess where you sort of have maybe spent some time mm-hmm. plying your trade as a as experts in gluing together the lego bricks that existed and then all of a sudden there's like a, mm-hmm. a lego kit that arrives that your customer can just buy instead of paying you by the day for a couple of months to, to put something together yeah um, <laughs> it's happened way too many times <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um so uh, you mentioned that a lot of the the time and uh uh, I think you mentioned PTSD um, that goes into building a um, an ML sort of solution is is about data cleansing, and I can definitely believe that. One of my uh, actually my first customer as the Scale Factory was a company called Songkick, who are uh, based here in the UK, doing um, discovery of concerts and ticket sales and, and that sort of thing. They were eventually acquired by Warner Music. Um, they um, they had started as a um, a a crowd-sourced repository of information about concerts, and the data they had was a real state. There were sort of three or four entries for the same band with different spelling and all that kind of stuff. I can fully believe that the the work that goes on in in your universe is all about sort of correcting for the human mess that sort of put put the garbage on the on the input end. Yes. Um, how how do you deal with that? And is that something that is improving over time with with new services that are released? So, I mean, the services can't necessarily fix the human error, right? And that's always some a challenge in the technology field. Human error is still a problem. So one of the things that is happening, I think, now that people are aware that data is is so important if you want to take it, take it to the next level and make data-driven decisions, um, what is improving over time is people are taking more of an effort to cleansing and ensuring that their data is of a higher quality. Um, and I think that's the change that's happening. I think the services that are coming on board around uh, like validating your data sets before it does actually get uh, tripped off into a database is definitely a lot better. Than- so there's definitely an element of change that has happened. And I think a lot of it is around mindset. Uh, people are starting to get more aware of how, how important data is and not just dumping it into different databases now. Right. So like the, uh, the, the I guess in the 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 devops landscape we're moving things left like from from production into development into design and so forth i i guess you you're saying that the the same's happening with data i think when once you know that your data is going to be yes. used a certain way by the ml estate you might think about it differently in the design of your mm-hmm. application exactly. interesting exactly um so um, we mentioned, uh, you know, new, new services and, and reinvent. Tell me what what you saw at reinvent that was uh, particularly exciting. Whether that was a you know new product launch or or some of the uh, the talks that uh, that were published. There were so many, John. Honestly speaking, there's just too many to mention. Um, but I think the two that I have to give a call out for is the Health Lake, and um, actually I have to mention three. <laughs> Sorry, I have to mention, mention as many as you um, like. <laughs> it's just I, there's just way too, too many. <laughs> but so the three that excited me the most was the health lake. Um, reason being, I am getting closer and closer into the healthcare space, and a huge problem we've had is 
data privacy and HIPAA compliance. And um, the, the, the solution that AWS has managed to put together makes it so much more easier for us to actually collect all that data, the health-related data. So I'm super excited about that one. Um, the second one is um, on Redshift, there's a bunch of new service data machine learning modeling. So um, I have traditionally used Redshift at quite a few of our, our clients and product spaces. And essentially, if we have that extra layer where we can easily concatenate machine learning models from those databases, it's it's gold for us, right? We don't have to focus enough too much on the data ops side mm -hmm. of things. So that's another one I'm super excited about. And then the third one is Panorama which is an edge device computer vision model. So I have no idea what it entails, but I do know that it has NVIDIA's Jetpacks, a Jetpack um, GPU on board. So that would be very interesting because I have worked with the NVIDIA separately, but now seeing it on be very interesting to see how it all kind of plays together. So yeah, those are the three main ones that, that were very exciting for me. Yeah, pa Panorama looked like it was maybe designed for um, security, you know, actual sort of, you know, visual security mm -hmm. uh, surveillance. things. Surveillance, yeah. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, I guess we'll have to uh, maybe uh, maybe rub a bit of the uh, the bias detection on it and make sure that it's not doing the, the awful things that our uh, human surveillance systems are doing. Um, but also I think that um, a lot of stuff in the manufacturing landscape where you're kind of maybe using a machine learning model to, to look for defects in a manufacturing pipeline and, and so forth. It's all, uh, yeah. all pretty, pretty interesting stuff. I mean, we, we don't do any work in, or well, mm, we've done a bit of work in the manufacturing sector but not a huge amount of it and that those sorts of things you kind of look at and go i can see why that's useful um but it's probably not for for our clients but yeah definitely interesting stuff i think the the um the question of um you know data ops going away because you can move your you, you can just run your models on data stores that already exist that to me as an outsider seemed like the valuable thing it was it was very obvious to me as someone who doesn't really work in in ai ml that if you don't have to do all that hard work to and heavy lifting mm. to shuffle your data around so that you can point a machine learning system at it then you're maybe more likely to experiment you're maybe a, a bit easier to to operate and i can see that being a quite a differentiator actually i think um someone this week on one of the mailing lists i pay attention to uh, was talking about how um the the google cloud landscape is is a little bit difficult in terms of how well things are joined up together in to terms together. of you know mm. moving data around have you do, have you done anything with the uh, the other clouds and what what's the uh, what does the landscape look like in comparison now is it is uh, is aws ahead are they behind what what is that in the in the competitive mm. landscape yeah, so I mean, over time, I have I've seen this weird race going on. Um, uh, Google Cloud and Azure have been quite ahead in terms of the in the machine learning space for the past couple of years, but it it looks like AWS just had I don't know what what steroids they were on <laughs> in this past year, but they've really just ramped up their machine learning services in that time. And um, now, so previously, I would say that from a from a machine learning services perspective, probably Google and Azure were were ahead. But now considering all the new reInvent stuff that have come on board, it looks like AWS is definitely on the same same level as all of them. I obviously still have to test out a lot of them, but judging by all the services that I've seen and judging by look, looking at the different features that are coming on board, it definitely looks like everyone is on the same sort of plane now. Yeah, good stuff. Great. Well, thanks, Archie, for uh, for your talk and for joining us uh, all the way from uh, Johannesburg this evening. Um, I can tell by the, uh, the the Twitch stream chat that uh, that uh, you've obviously reached an audience of uh, of interested parties. Where can we find you on the internet if we want to see more of your you know, talks? Maybe you blog. You know, you do tweet about stuff. Um, how do we find you? Yeah. So definitely on LinkedIn, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I'm not really a Twitter person, but I should probably get into it. So yeah, definitely on LinkedIn. And I am thinking of opening up a blog soon enough. So probably everything will be on my LinkedIn page. Yep, great stuff. Thanks, Archie. Uh, we will hopefully Thanks. see you again soon. Cheers.